1. The Purpose of Life The very purpose of our life is to seek happiness. That is clear. Whether one believes in religion or not, whether one believes in this religion or that religion, we are all seeking something better in life. So the very motion of our life is toward happiness. Our days are numbered. At this very moment, many thousands are born into the world, some destined to live only a few days or weeks, others destined to push through to the century mark, perhaps even a bit beyond, savoring every taste life has to offer, triumph, despair, joy, hatred, and love. We never know. But whether we live a day or a century, a central question always remains. What is the purpose of our life? What makes our lives meaningful? The purpose of our life needs to be positive. We weren't born with the purpose of causing trouble, harming others. For our life to be of value, we must develop basic good human qualities. Warmth, kindness, compassion. Then, our life becomes meaningful and more peaceful, happier. In Buddhism, the principle of causality is accepted as a natural law. If you want a particular event or experience to occur, then the logical thing to do is to seek the causes and conditions that give rise to it. So, if you desire happiness, you should seek the causes that give rise to it. And if you don't desire suffering, then what you should do is ensure that the causes and conditions that would give rise to it no longer arise. The purpose of our life is happiness. That simple statement can be used as a powerful tool in helping us navigate through life's daily problems. From that perspective, our task becomes one of discarding the things that lead to suffering and accumulating the things that lead to happiness. The method, the daily practice, involves gradually increasing our awareness and understanding of what truly leads to happiness and what doesn't. Although it is possible to achieve happiness, happiness is not a simple thing. There are many levels. In Buddhism, for instance, there is a reference to the four factors of fulfillment, or happiness. Wealth, worldly satisfaction, spirituality, and enlightenment. Together, they embrace the totality of an individual's quest for happiness. When life becomes too complicated, overwhelming, or confusing, it's useful to stand back and remind ourselves of our overall purpose or goal. Take an hour, an afternoon, or even several days to reflect on what it is that will truly bring us happiness, and then reset our priorities based on that. This can put our life back in proper context, allow a fresh perspective, and enable us to see what direction to take. The turning toward happiness as a valid goal and the conscious decision to systematically seek it can profoundly change the rest of our lives. If we utilize our favorable circumstances, such as our good health or wealth, in positive ways, in helping others, they can be contributory factors in achieving a happier life. And of course, we enjoy these things, our material facilities, success, and so on. But without the right mental attitude, without attention to the mental factor, these things have very little impact on our long-term feelings of happiness. If you harbor hateful thoughts or intense anger deep within yourself, it ruins your health. Thus, it destroys one of the factors conventionally considered necessary for a happy life. Or, even if you have wonderful possessions, in an intense moment of anger, you may feel like throwing or breaking them. They mean nothing. So there is no guarantee that wealth alone can give you the joy or fulfillment you are seeking. These examples indicate the tremendous influence that the mental state, the mind factor, has on our experience of daily life. Naturally, then, we have to take that factor very seriously. Now, Sometimes people confuse happiness with pleasure. True happiness relates more to the mind and heart. 
Happiness that depends mainly on physical pleasure is unstable. One day it's there, the next day it may not be. Sometimes, making the right choice in life is difficult because it involves some sacrifice of our momentary pleasures. But framing any decision we face with the question, will this bring me happiness, can be a powerful strategy to help us skillfully conduct all areas of our lives, not just in the decision whether to indulge in drugs or that third piece of banana cream pie. Asking ourselves this fundamental question puts a new slant on things, shifting the focus from what we are denying ourselves to what we are truly seeking, ultimate happiness. From a conversation between the Dalai Lama and Howard Cutler. Are you happy? Howard asked the Dalai Lama. Yes, he said. He paused, then added, Yes, definitely. There was a quiet sincerity in his voice that left no doubt. But is happiness a reasonable goal for most of us? Is it really possible? Yes, he replied. I believe that happiness can be achieved through training the mind. Training the mind in this context does not refer to mind merely as one's cognitive ability or intellect. Rather, the term training the mind can be thought of in the sense of the Tibetan word sem, which has a much broader meaning, closer to psyche or spirit. It includes intellect and feeling, heart and mind. By bringing about a certain inner discipline, we can undergo a transformation of our attitude, our entire outlook, and approach to living. The concept of achieving true happiness has, in the West, always seemed ill-defined, elusive, ungraspable. Even the word happy is derived from the Icelandic word hap, meaning luck or chance. It didn't seem to be the sort of thing that could be developed simply by training the mind an idea that has been the cornerstone of Buddhist practice for 2,500 years. Recently, however, with new scientific research consistently supporting the Dalai Lama's views, we've seen Buddhist principles converging with Western science, as researchers now agree that happiness can be deliberately cultivated, much like learning any other skill. The greater level of calmness of our mind, the greater our peace of mind, the greater our ability to enjoy a happy and a joyful life. When we speak of a calm state of mind or peace of mind, we shouldn't confuse that with a totally insensitive, apathetic state of mind. Having a calm or peaceful state of mind doesn't mean being totally spaced out or completely empty. Peace of mind or a calm state of mind is rooted in affection and compassion there is a very high level of sensitivity and feeling there. As long as there is a lack of the inner discipline that brings calmness of mind, no matter what external facilities or conditions you have, they will never give you the feeling of joy and happiness that you are seeking. On the other hand, if you possess this inner quality, a calmness of mind, a degree of stability within, then even if you lack various external facilities, that you would normally consider necessary for happiness, it is still possible to live a happy and joyful life. We don't need more money. We don't need greater success or fame. We don't need the perfect body or even the perfect mate. Right now, at this very moment, we have a mind which is all the basic equipment we need to achieve complete happiness. It is felt that a disciplined mind leads to happiness, and an undisciplined mind leads to suffering. And in fact, it is said that bringing about discipline within one's mind is the essence of the Buddha's teaching. This is self-discipline, not discipline that's externally imposed on you by someone else. Also, this is discipline that's applied to overcome negative qualities. For instance, a criminal gang may need discipline to perform a successful robbery, but that discipline is useless. When we speak of this inner discipline, it can of course involve many things, many methods. But generally speaking, one begins by identifying those factors 
that lead to happiness and those factors that lead to suffering. Having done this, one then sets about gradually eliminating those mental factors, emotions, or behaviors that lead to suffering and cultivating those that lead to happiness. That is the way. Achieving genuine happiness may require a transformation of your outlook, your way of thinking, and this is not a simple matter. You shouldn't have the notion that there is just one key, a secret, and if you can get that right, then everything will be okay. It is similar to taking proper care of the physical body. You need a variety of vitamins and nutrients, not just one or two. In the same way, in order to achieve happiness, you need a variety of approaches and methods to deal with and overcome the varied and complex negative mental states. The first step in seeking happiness is learning. We first have to learn how negative emotions and behaviors are harmful, not only to one personally, but harmful to society and the future of the whole world as well. This enhances our determination to face and overcome them. Then, there is the realization of the beneficial aspects of the positive emotions and behaviors. Once we realize that, we become determined to cherish, develop, and increase those positive emotions, no matter how difficult that is. There is a kind of spontaneous willingness from within. Survey after survey has shown that it is unhappy people who tend to be most self-focused and are often socially withdrawn, brooding, and even antagonistic. In contrast, studies show that happy people are more likely to attract a mate and have stronger marriages and better relationships in general. They enjoy better physical health, living up to 10 years longer. Happiness also leads to better mental health, greater creativity, resilience, and an increased capacity to deal with adversity. In addition, happy individuals achieve greater career success and earn higher incomes, essentially enjoying greater personal success on every level. And most important, they are found to be more loving and forgiving than unhappy people, more willing to reach out and help others. Transforming your mind takes time. There are a lot of negative mental traits, so you need to address and counteract each one of them. That isn't easy. It requires the repeated application of various techniques and taking the time to familiarize yourself with the practices. It's a process of learning. No matter what activity or practice we are pursuing, there isn't anything that isn't made easier through constant familiarity and training. Through training, we can change. We can transform ourselves. The cultivation of greater happiness by training the mind is possible because of the very structure and function of the brain. Although genetically hardwired with certain innate or instinctual behavior patterns, the brain is not static, not irrevocably fixed. It is adaptable, malleable, changing individual neurons and reconfiguring its wiring according to new thoughts and experiences. The brain's inherent capacity to change in response to learning is known as neuroplasticity, a process that provides the physiological basis for the idea of training the mind for happiness and the possibility of inner transformation. At the beginning, the implementation of the positive practices is very small, so the negative influences are still very powerful. However, eventually, as you gradually build up the positive practices, the negative behaviors are automatically diminished. Through repeated practice of these methods, we can get to the point where some disturbance may occur, but the negative effects on our mind remain on the surface, like the waves that may ripple on the surface of an ocean, but don't have much effect deep down. You should never lose sight of the importance of having a realistic attitude, of being very sensitive to and respectful of the concrete reality of your situation as you proceed on the path toward your ultimate goal. Recognize the difficulties inherent in your path and the fact that it may take time and a consistent effort. It's also important to make a clear distinction in your mind between your ideals 
and the standards by which you judge your progress. Change takes time. Every day, as soon as you get up, you can develop a sincere positive motivation, thinking, I will utilize this day in a more positive way. I should not waste this very day. And then, at night before bed, check what you've done, asking yourself, Did I utilize this day as I planned? The demarcation between a positive and a negative desire or action is not whether it gives you an immediate feeling of satisfaction, but whether it ultimately results in positive or negative consequences. Certain desires are positive, a desire for happiness, for peace, for a friendlier world. These are very useful. But at some point, desires can become unreasonable. Greed is an exaggerated form of desire, and that leads to trouble. Although the underlying motive of greed is to seek satisfaction, the irony is that even after obtaining the object of your desire, you are still not satisfied. The true antidote to greed is contentment. If you have a strong sense of contentment, it doesn't matter whether you obtain the object or not. Either way, you are still content. Our feelings of contentment are strongly influenced by our tendency to compare. Constant comparison with those who are smarter, more beautiful, or more successful than we are also tends to breed envy, frustration, and unhappiness. But we can use this same principle in a positive way. We can increase our feelings of life satisfaction by comparing ourselves with those who are less fortunate than we are and by reflecting on all the things we have. So, how can we achieve inner contentment? There are two methods. One method is to obtain everything that we want and desire. All the money, houses, cars, the perfect mate, and the perfect body. The Dalai Lama has pointed out the disadvantage of this approach. If our wants and desires remain unchecked, sooner or later we will run up against something that we want but can't have. The second method is not to have what we want, but rather to want what we have. Proper utilization of time is so important. While we have this body, and especially this amazing human brain, every minute is something precious. Our day-to-day -day existence is very much alive with hope, although there is no guarantee of our future. There is no guarantee, at this time, that tomorrow we will be here. But still, we are working for that purely on the basis of hope. So, we need to make the best use of our time. If you can, serve other people and other sentient beings. If not, at least refrain from harming them. This is the whole basis of the philosophy. A stunning recent study has found that happiness is highly contagious, spreading in social networks just like a virus. Other studies show that positive emotions act as an antidote to prejudice, causing changes in the brain that prevent the instinctual bias against those we perceive as different, breaking down the barriers between us and them. Investigators have also linked higher levels of happiness with greater freedom and democracy in a nation. So it could be argued that if you are truly concerned about building a better world, it is your duty to be happy. The Dalai Lama's personal happiness seems to manifest as a simple willingness to reach out to others, creating a feeling of affinity and spreading goodwill, even in the briefest of encounters. One morning, the Dalai Lama was walking back to his hotel room. Noticing one of the housekeeping staff by the elevators, he stopped to ask, Where are you from? For a moment, she appeared taken aback by this man in strange maroon robes and his entourage, but she smiled and answered shyly, Mexico? They briefly chatted before he walked on, leaving her looking excited and pleased. The next morning, she appeared at the same spot with another housekeeper, and they greeted him warmly as he got into the elevator. The interaction was brief, 
but they both seemed to be flushed with happiness as they returned to work. Every day after that, they were joined by a few more of the housekeeping staff at the designated time and place, until by the end of the week there were dozens of maids in their crisp gray and white uniforms, forming a receiving line that stretched along the length of the path that led to the elevators. Part 2 Human Warmth and Compassion If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. And if you want yourself to be happy, practice compassion. There is no question that happiness brings tremendous personal rewards. But it is also critical to point out that cultivating greater happiness benefits not only oneself, but also one's family, community, and society. This is one of the key principles underlying the art of happiness. Now, we are made to seek happiness, and it is clear that feelings of love, affection, closeness, and compassion bring happiness. Every one of us has the basis to be happy, to access the warm and compassionate states of mind that bring happiness. In an experiment, neuroscientist Dr. Richard Davidson asked a Buddhist monk to meditate intensively on compassion while he monitored the monk's brain function in the lab. Brain scans showed a dramatic increase in activity in the monk's left prefrontal cortex as he deliberately generated a compassionate state of mind, lighting up the region of the brain associated with feelings of happiness. In another study, subjects performed five random acts of kindness once a week for six weeks. This resulted in a significant increase in their levels of happiness and life satisfaction. Within all beings, there is the seed of perfection. However, compassion is required in order to activate that seed that is inherent in our hearts and minds. A compassionate, warm, kind-hearted person is a healthy person. If you maintain a feeling of compassion and loving-kindness, then something automatically opens your inner door. Through that, you can communicate much more easily with other people, and that feeling of warmth creates a kind of openness. You'll find that all human beings are just like you, so you'll be able to relate to them more easily. Approaching others with a thought of compassion automatically changes your attitude toward them, reducing fear, self-doubt, and insecurity. There is often a danger of confusing compassion with attachment. So when we discuss compassion, we must first make a distinction between two types of love or compassion. One kind of compassion is tinged with attachment, the feeling of controlling someone, or loving someone so that person will love you back. This ordinary type of love or compassion is quite partial and biased. It is based on your mental projection, on your perceiving that person as a friend or loved one, and a relationship based on that alone is unstable. But there is a second type of compassion that is free from such attachment. That is genuine compassion. That kind of compassion isn't so much based on the fact that this person or that person is dear to you. Rather, genuine compassion is based on the rationale that all human beings have an innate desire to be happy and overcome suffering just like yourself. And just like yourself, they have the natural right to fulfill this fundamental aspiration. With this as a foundation, you can feel compassion regardless of whether you view the other person as a friend or an enemy. Compassion can be roughly defined in terms of a state of mind that is nonviolent, non harming, and non aggressive. It is a mental attitude based on the wish for others to be free of their suffering and is associated with a sense of commitment, responsibility, and respect toward the other. The Tibetan word for compassion, tsewa, 
refers to an attitude or state of mind that includes not only a wish for the welfare of others, a wish for others to be free of their suffering, but also a wish for good things for oneself. In developing compassion, perhaps one could begin with the wish that one be free of suffering, and then take that natural feeling toward oneself and cultivate it, enhance it, and extend it out to include and embrace others. If you wish to develop a feeling of affinity or connectedness with others, a feeling of openness, without fear or apprehension, then you first need to realize the usefulness of compassion. That's the key factor. Once you accept the fact that compassion is not something childish or sentimental, once you realize that it is something really worthwhile, realize its deeper value, then you immediately develop an attraction toward it, a willingness to cultivate it. Compassion isn't just a religious matter. It's an indispensable factor in day-to-day life, beginning at birth. Our very first act after birth is to suck our mother's milk. That's an act of affection, of compassion. Without that, we cannot survive. Then, our physical structure seems to be more suited to feelings of love, compassion, and affection. These are emotions that have beneficial effects on our physical health and emotional well-being. These gentler emotions and behaviors also lead to a happier family and community life. There is a basic human level where distinctions between people, gender, race, religion, culture, and language, break down. At this fundamental level, we are all the same. Each one of us aspires to happiness and does not wish to suffer. Of course, there may be differences in our cultural background, way of life, our faith or color. But we are all human beings, consisting of a human body, human mind, and emotions. Whenever you meet people, remember to have the feeling that you are encountering another human being, just like yourself. If we can relate to others on that basic level and leave the differences aside, we can easily communicate, exchange ideas, and share experiences. Can we cultivate ourselves to be more compassionate? If so, how do we do it? Here, profound recognition of the fundamental sameness of the human family and the deeply interconnected nature of our well-being are crucially important. As a species, we need to ground our interaction with fellow human beings on recognition of these profound yet simple truths. In generating compassion, you start by recognizing that you do not want suffering and that you have a right to have happiness. This can be verified or validated by your own experience. You then recognize that other people, just like yourself, also do not want to suffer and that they have a right to have happiness. So this becomes the basis of your beginning to generate compassion. In one sense, One could define compassion as the feeling of unbearableness at the sight of other people's suffering, other sentient beings' suffering. And in order to generate that feeling, one must first have an appreciation of the seriousness or intensity of another's suffering. The more fully one understands suffering and the various kinds of suffering that we are subject to, the deeper will be one's level of compassion. When you think about your own suffering, you might feel overwhelmed, helpless. There's a sense of being burdened, a kind of dullness or numbness. Now, in generating compassion, when you're taking on another's suffering, you may also initially experience a certain discomfort, a sense of unbearableness. But with compassion, the feeling is much different. Underlying the uncomfortable feeling is a high level of alertness and determination because you are voluntarily and deliberately sharing another's suffering for a higher purpose. There's a feeling of connectedness and commitment, a willingness to reach out to others, 
a feeling of freshness rather than dullness. In looking at the various means of developing compassion, empathy is an important factor, the ability to appreciate another's suffering. One can attempt to increase compassion by trying to empathize with another's feelings or experience, by using your imagination, your creativity, to visualize yourself in another's situation. When you meet people, always approach them from the standpoint of the most basic things you have in common. We each have a physical structure, a mind, emotions. We are all born in the same way, and we all die. All of us want happiness and do not want to suffer. Looking at others from this standpoint, rather than emphasizing secondary differences, such as the fact that he is Tibetan, or she is a different color or religion, or he has a different cultural background, allows us to have a feeling that I'm meeting someone just the same as me. Relating to others on this level makes it much easier to exchange and communicate with one another. Empathy is important not only as a means of enhancing compassion, but generally speaking, when dealing with others on any level, if you're having some difficulties, it's extremely helpful to be able to try to put yourself in the other person's place and see how you would react to the situation. On a personal level, being open and sharing things can be very useful. It can help you make friends more easily, and it's a matter not just of knowing people and having a superficial exchange, but of really sharing your deepest problems and suffering. And it's the same thing when you hear good news. Immediately share it with others, so you'll feel a sense of intimacy and connection with your friends. If one is seeking to build a truly satisfying relationship, the best way of bringing this about is to get to know the deeper nature of the person and relate to her or him on that level, instead of merely on the basis of superficial characteristics. And in this type of relationship, there is a role for genuine compassion. If you are running into relationship problems, it's often very helpful to simply stand back and reflect on the underlying nature and basis of that relationship. For example, among friendships, there can be some that are based on wealth, power, or position. These friendships will continue as long as your wealth, power, or position is sustained but the friendship will begin to disappear once those grounds are no longer there. On the other hand, there can be another kind of friendship based on true human feeling, a feeling of closeness, in which there is a sense of sharing and connectedness. The factor that sustains a genuine friendship is a feeling of affection. Some relationships are based on sexual attraction but there can be two principal types of sexual attraction-based relationships. The first type is based on pure sexual desire. A relationship built primarily on sexual desire is like a house built on a foundation of ice. As soon as the ice melts, the building collapses. In the second type, in addition to physical attraction, there is an underlying appreciation of the value of the other person a mutual respect, based on taking enough time to genuinely get to know each other's basic characteristics. This relationship will be much more long-lasting and reliable. Leaving aside how the endless pursuit of romantic love may affect our deeper spiritual growth, even from the perspective of a conventional way of life, the idealization of this romantic love can be seen as an extreme Unlike those relationships based on caring and genuine affection, this is another matter. It's something that is based on fantasy, is unattainable, and therefore may be a source of frustration. So, on that basis, it cannot be seen as a positive thing. In many cases, people tend to expect the other person to respond to them in a positive way first rather than taking the initiative themselves to create that possibility. That's wrong. It leads to problems 
and can act as a barrier that just serves to promote a feeling of isolation from others. So if you wish to overcome that feeling of isolation and loneliness, your underlying attitude makes a tremendous difference. And approaching others with the thought of compassion in your mind is the best way to do this. Not only do we inherently possess the potential for compassion, but also the basic or underlying nature of human beings is to be gentle and compassionate. That is the predominant feature of human nature. However, it is not enough that this is our underlying nature. We must also develop a deep awareness and appreciation of that fact, changing how we perceive ourselves. This can have a very real impact on how we interact with others and how we conduct our daily lives. Once we conclude that the basic nature of humanity is compassionate rather than aggressive, our relationship to the world around us changes immediately. Seeing others as basically compassionate instead of hostile and selfish helps us relax, trust, live at ease. It makes us happier. When human intelligence and human goodness or affection are used together, all human actions become constructive. When we combine a warm heart with knowledge and education, we can learn to respect others' views and others' rights. This becomes the basis of a spirit of reconciliation that can be used to overcome aggression and resolve our conflict. So, no matter how much violence or how many bad things we have to go through, the ultimate solution to our conflicts, both internal and external, lies in returning to our basic or underlying human nature, which is gentle and compassionate. Part 3. Transforming Suffering Problems are bound to arise in life. Trying to avoid or simply not think about them may provide temporary relief, but there is a better approach. If you're in a battle, as long as you remain ignorant of the status and combat capability of your enemy, you will be totally unprepared and paralyzed by fear. But if you know your opponent's fighting capability, weaponry, and so on, then you're in a much better position when you engage in the war. Similarly, Directly confronting your suffering, rather than avoiding it, will help you appreciate the depth and nature of the problem, and you'll be in a better position to deal with it. As long as we view suffering as an unnatural state, an abnormal condition that we fear, avoid, and reject, we will never uproot the causes of suffering and begin to live a happier life. Our attitude toward suffering becomes very important because it can affect how we cope with suffering when it arises. Now, our usual attitude consists of an intense aversion and intolerance of our pain and suffering. However, if we can transform our attitude toward suffering, adopt an attitude that allows us greater tolerance of it, then this can do much to help counteract feelings of mental unhappiness, dissatisfaction, and discontent. While it is natural to recoil from suffering, sometimes, it can strengthen us, even bring out our best. As a character in Graham Greene's The Third Man observes, in Italy for thirty years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed. But they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they have brotherly love, five hundred years of democracy and peace. And what did they produce? The cuckoo clock. At other times, suffering can soften us, causing a vulnerability that can deepen our connection with others. As poet William Wordsworth said, A deep distress hath humanized my soul. In searching for some meaning or practical value of suffering, there is one aspect of our suffering that is of vital importance. Awareness of your pain and suffering helps you develop your capacity for empathy the capacity that allows you to relate to others' feelings and suffering. This enhances your capacity for compassion toward others. So, as an aid in helping us connect with others, 
it can be seen as having value. Looking at suffering in this way, our attitude may begin to change. Our suffering may not be as bad as we think. The time and effort we spend searching for meaning in suffering will pay great rewards when bad things begin to strike. But in order to reap those rewards, we must begin our search for meaning when things are going well. A tree with strong roots can withstand the most violent storm, but the tree can't grow roots just as the storm appears on the horizon. Reflecting on suffering has tremendous importance because by realizing the nature of suffering, you will develop greater resolve to put an end to the causes of suffering and the unwholesome deeds that lead to suffering. And it will increase your enthusiasm for engaging in the wholesome actions and deeds that lead to happiness and joy. The point that has to be borne in mind is that the reason why reflection on suffering is so important is that there is a possibility of a way out. There is an alternative. There is a possibility of freedom from suffering. There are many ways in which we actively contribute to our own experience of mental unrest and suffering. Although in general, afflictive emotions can come naturally, often it is our own reinforcement of those negative emotions that makes things so much worse. For instance, when we have anger or hatred toward a person, if we think about the injustices done to us, the ways that we have been unfairly treated, and keep thinking about it over and over, it feeds the hatred. Through this constant familiarity and thinking, we ourselves can make our emotions more intense and powerful. We often add to our pain and suffering by being overly sensitive, overreacting to minor things, and sometimes taking things too personally. We tend to take small things too seriously and blow them up out of proportion, while at the same time we often remain indifferent to the really important things, those things that have profound effects on our lives and long-term consequences and implications. So to a large extent, whether or not you suffer depends on how you respond to a given situation. The beginning of being released from suffering is to investigate one of the primary causes, resistance to change. It's extremely important to investigate the causes or origins of suffering, how it arises. One must begin that process by appreciating the impermanent, transient nature of our existence. All things, events, and phenomena are dynamic, changing every moment. Nothing remains static. So, at any given moment, no matter how pleasant or pleasurable your experience may be, it will not last. This becomes the basis of a category of suffering known in Buddhism as the suffering of change. The act of acceptance, of acknowledging that change is a natural part of our interactions with others, can play a vital role in our relationships. We may discover that it is at the very time when we may feel most disappointed, as if something has gone out of the relationship, that a profound transformation can occur. Although you may not always be able to avoid difficult situations, you can modify the extent to which you suffer by how you choose to respond to the situation. Each of us has done some wrong. There are things we regret, things we have done, things we should have done, or things we didn't do. Acknowledging our wrongdoings with a genuine sense of remorse can help keep us on the right track, encouraging us to rectify our mistakes and correct things in the future. But if we allow regret to degenerate into guilt, holding onto the memory of our past transgressions with self-blame and self-hatred, this serves no purpose other than becoming a relentless source of self-punishment and self-induced suffering. The ability to look at events from different perspectives can be very helpful. Then, practicing this, one can use certain experiences, certain tragedies, to develop a calmness of mind. One must realize that every phenomenon, every event, has different aspects. Everything is of a relative nature. In our daily life, problems invariably arise, 
But problems themselves do not automatically cause suffering. If we can directly address our problem and focus our energies on finding a solution, for instance, the problem can be transformed into a challenge. Generally speaking, once you're already in a difficult situation, it isn't possible to change your attitude simply by adopting a particular thought once or twice. Rather, it's a process of learning, training, and getting used to new viewpoints that enable you to deal with the difficulty. A supple mind, a flexible mode of thinking, helps us address our problems from a variety of perspectives. And conversely, deliberately examining problems from different angles is a kind of flexibility training for the mind. Life today is characterized by sudden, unexpected, and sometimes violent change. A supple mind can help us reconcile the changes going on all around us. Without cultivating a pliant mind, our outlook becomes brittle and our relationship to the world becomes characterized by fear. But by adopting a flexible approach to life, we can maintain our composure even under the most turbulent conditions. It is through our efforts to achieve a flexible mind that we can nurture the resilience of the human spirit. It seems that whenever there are intense emotions involved, there tends to be a disparity between how things appear and how they really are. In general, if we carefully examine any given situation in an unbiased and honest way, we'll realize that to a large extent, we are also responsible for the unfolding of events. This practice involves looking at things in a holistic way, realizing that there are many events contributing to a situation. Whether we are successful or not, even the honest attempt to search for our own contribution to a problem allows a certain shift of focus that helps to break through the narrow patterns of thinking that lead to the destructive feeling of unfairness that is the source of so much discontent in ourselves and in the world. A balanced and skillful approach to life, taking care to avoid extremes, becomes a very important factor in conducting one's everyday existence. It is important in all aspects of life. Once there was a disciple of a Greek philosopher who was commanded by his master for three years to give money to everyone who insulted him. When this period was over, the master said, Now you can go to Athens and learn wisdom. Upon entering Athens, the disciple met a certain wise man sitting at the gate, insulting everyone who came and went. He also insulted the disciple, who burst out laughing. Why do you laugh? asked the wise man. Because, said the disciple, for three years I have been paying for this kind of thing, and now you give it to me for nothing. Enter the city, said the wise man. It is all yours. The ability to shift perspective, asking, how can I see this differently, can be one of the most powerful and effective tools we have to help us cope with life's daily problems. Part 4. Overcoming Obstacles The first step in seeking happiness is learning. Learning how the negative emotions and behaviors are harmful to us and how the positive emotions are helpful. In bringing about positive changes within oneself, learning is only the first step. There are other factors as well. Conviction, determination, action, and effort. The next step is developing conviction. Learning and education are important because they help one develop conviction of the need to change. This conviction to change then develops into determination. Next, one transforms determination into action. The strong determination to change enables one to make a sustained effort to implement the actual changes. This final factor of effort is critical. Now, no matter what behavior you are seeking to change, no matter what particular goal or action you are directing your efforts toward, 
you need to start by developing a strong willingness or wish to do it. You need to generate great enthusiasm. And here, a sense of urgency is a key factor. This sense of urgency is a powerful factor in helping you overcome problems. In order to generate a sense of urgency to engage in spiritual practices, the practitioner is reminded of our impermanence, of death. That awareness of impermanence is encouraged, so that when it is coupled with our appreciation of the enormous potential of our human existence, it will give us a sense of urgency that we must use every precious moment. By making a steady effort, we can overcome any form of negative conditioning and make positive changes in our lives. But you still need to realize that genuine change doesn't happen overnight. There is no getting around these essential ingredients, determination, effort, and time. These are the real secrets to happiness. All deluded states of mind, all afflictive emotions and thoughts, are essentially distorted, in that they are rooted in misperceiving the actual reality of the situation. No matter how powerful, deep down these negative emotions have no valid foundation. They are based on ignorance. On the other hand, All the positive emotions or states of mind, such as love, compassion, insight, and so on, have a solid basis. When the mind is experiencing these positive states, there is no distortion. Our positive states of mind can act as antidotes to our negative tendencies and delusory states of mind. As you enhance the capacity of these antidotal factors, the greater their force, the more you will be able to reduce the force of the mental and emotional afflictions, the more you will be able to reduce the influences and effects of these things. Some suggest that since negative emotions are a natural part of our mind, there is no way to really overcome them. But that is wrong. For example, all of us are born in an ignorant state. So ignorance is also quite natural. If we leave ourselves in our natural state without making an effort to learn, we won't be able to dispel ignorance. But as we grow, we can acquire knowledge and dispel ignorance through education. Similarly, through proper training, we can gradually reduce our negative emotions and increase positive states of mind, such as love, compassion, and forgiveness. The very fact that we can change our emotions and counteract negative thoughts by applying alternative ways of thinking lends support to the Dalai Lama's position that we can overcome our negative mental states through the application of the antidotes or the corresponding positive mental states. And when this fact is combined with recent scientific evidence, that we can change the structure and function of the brain by cultivating new thoughts, then the idea that we can achieve happiness through training of the mind seems a very real possibility. Dealing with expectations is really a tricky issue. If you have excessive expectations without a proper foundation, then that usually leads to problems. On the other hand, Without expectation and hope, without aspiration, there can be no progress. Some hope is essential. So finding the proper balance is not easy. One needs to judge each situation on the spot. The essential nature of mind is pure. It is based on the belief that the underlying basic subtle consciousness is untainted by the negative emotions. Its nature is pure, a state that is referred to as the mind of clear light. That basic nature of the mind is also called Buddha nature. So, since the negative emotions are not an intrinsic part of this Buddha nature, there is a possibility to eliminate them and purify the mind. 
Hatred and anger are considered to be the greatest evils because they are the greatest obstacles to developing compassion and altruism, and they destroy one's virtue and calmness of mind. The destructive effects of anger and hatred are well documented by the many scientific studies showing these emotions to be a significant cause of disease and premature death. In fact, hostility is now considered to be a major risk factor in heart disease. Of course, one doesn't need scientific evidence of the destructive nature of these emotions to realize how they can cloud our judgment cause feelings of extreme discomfort, or wreak havoc in our personal relationships. Our personal experience can tell us that. Usually, we don't bother much about anger or hatred, so it just comes. But once we develop a cautious attitude toward these emotions, that reluctant attitude itself can act as a preventative measure against anger or hatred. Feelings of anger and hatred arise from a mind that is troubled by dissatisfaction and discontent. So you can prepare ahead of time by constantly working toward building inner contentment and cultivating kindness and compassion. This brings about a certain calmness of mind that can help prevent anger from arising in the first place. We cannot overcome anger and hatred simply by suppressing them. We need to actively cultivate the antidotes to them, patience and tolerance. Someone who gains victory over hatred and anger through such an arduous process is a true hero. If you can learn to develop patience and tolerance toward your enemies, then everything else becomes much easier your compassion toward all others begins to flow naturally. Now, there are many, many people in the world, but relatively few with whom we interact, and even fewer who cause us problems. So when you come across such a chance for practicing patience and tolerance, you should treat it with gratitude. It is rare. Just as having unexpectedly found a treasure in your own house you should be happy and grateful toward your enemy for providing that precious opportunity. Because if you are ever to be successful in your practice of patience and tolerance, which are critical factors in counteracting negative emotions, it is due to the combination of your own efforts and also the opportunity provided by your enemy. In fact, the enemy is the necessary condition for practicing patience. Without an enemy's action, there is no possibility for patience or tolerance to arise. Our friends do not ordinarily test us and provide the opportunity to cultivate patience. Only our enemies do this. So from this standpoint, we can consider our enemy as a great teacher and revere him or her for giving us this precious opportunity to practice patience. Since patience or tolerance comes from an ability to remain firm and steadfast and not be overwhelmed by the adverse situations or conditions that one faces, one should see tolerance or patience not as a sign of weakness or giving in, but rather as a sign of strength, coming from a deep ability to remain firm. An end result or product of patience and tolerance is forgiveness. When you are truly patient and tolerant, then forgiveness comes naturally. Feelings of grief and anxiety are natural responses to loss. But if you allow these feelings of loss and worry to persist, there's a danger. If these feelings are left unchecked, they can lead to a kind of self-absorption. If you find yourself worrying too much, it may help to think of the other people who have similar or even worse tragedies. Once you realize that, then you no longer feel isolated, as if you have been single-pointedly picked out. That can offer you some kind of condolence. If a difficult situation or problem is such that it can be remedied, then there is no need to worry. In other words, 
If there is a solution or a way out of the difficulty, then one needn't be overwhelmed by it. It is more sensible to spend the energy focusing on the solution rather than worrying about the problem. Alternatively, if there is no way out, no solution, no possibility of resolution, then there is also no point in worrying about it, because you can't do anything about it anyway. In the Dalai Lama's system of training the mind and achieving happiness, the closer one gets to being motivated by altruism, the more fearless one becomes in the face of even extremely anxiety-provoking circumstances. Motivation is so important. In fact, all human action can be seen in terms of movement, and the mover behind all actions is one's motivation. If you develop a pure and sincere motivation, if you are motivated by a wish to help on the basis of kindness, compassion, and respect, then you can carry on any kind of work in any field and function more effectively with less fear or worry, not being afraid of what others think or whether you ultimately will be successful in reaching your goal. Sincere motivation acts as an antidote to reduce fear and anxiety. When looking at our underlying sense of self, one can characterize two types. One sense of self, or ego, is concerned only with the fulfillment of one's self-interest, one's selfish desires, with complete disregard for the well-being of others. The other type of ego, or sense of self, is based on a genuine concern for others and the desire to be of service. In order to fulfill that wish to be of service, one needs a strong sense of self and a sense of self-confidence. This kind of self-confidence is the kind that leads to positive consequences. The more honest you are, the more open, the less fear you will have because there's no anxiety about being exposed or revealed to others. So the more honest you are, the more self-confident you will be. It seems that when problems arise, our outlook often becomes narrow. All of our attention may be focused on worrying about the problem, feeling as if we're the only one going through such difficulties, which makes the problem seem very intense when this happens, shifting perspective, seeing things from a wider perspective, can definitely help. If you only look at that one event, it appears bigger and bigger. If you focus too closely, too intensely on a problem, it appears uncontrollable. But if you compare that situation with some other greater event, look at your problem from a different perspective, from a distance then it appears smaller and less overwhelming. Part 5 On Living a Spiritual Life We often hear people say that all human beings are equal. By this, we mean that everyone has the obvious desire of happiness. Everybody has the right to be a happy person. And everyone has the right to overcome suffering. So if someone is deriving happiness or benefit from a particular religious tradition, it becomes important to respect the rights of others. Thus, we must learn to respect all these major religious traditions. That is clear. One way of strengthening mutual respect between those of different religious faiths is through closer contact, personal contact. Through this kind of closer contact, we can learn about the useful contributions that these religions have made to humanity the positive things, so when confronted with another religion, initially a positive feeling, a comfortable feeling, will arise. We'll feel if that person finds a different tradition more suitable, more effective, then that's good. Then it's like going to a restaurant. We can all sit down at one table and order different dishes according to one's own taste. We might eat different dishes, but nobody argues about it. There are so many things that divide humanity, so many problems in the world. Religion should be a remedy 
to help reduce the conflict and suffering in the world, not another source of conflict. There can be two levels of spirituality. One has to do with our religious beliefs. If we believe in any religion, that's good. But even without a religious belief, we can still manage. In some cases, we can manage even better. But that's our own individual right. If we wish to believe, good. If not, it's all right. But then there's another level of spirituality. It can be called basic spirituality. Basic human qualities of goodness, kindness, compassion, caring. Whether we are believers or non-believers, this kind of spirituality is essential. This second level of spirituality can be more important than the first, because no matter how wonderful a particular religion may be, it will still only be accepted by a limited number of human beings, only a portion of humanity. But as long as we are human beings, as long as we are members of the human family, all of us need these basic spiritual values. Without these, human existence remains hard, very dry. As a result, none of us can be a happy person, our whole family will suffer, and then, eventually, society will be more troubled. So, it becomes clear that cultivating these kinds of basic spiritual values becomes crucial. If you understand spiritual practice in its true sense, then you can use all 24 hours of your day for your practice. True spirituality is a mental attitude that you can practice at any time. Real spiritual practice is in some sense like a voltage stabilizer. The function of the stabilizer is to prevent irregular power surges and instead give you a stable and constant source of power. Engaging in training or a method of bringing about inner discipline within one's mind is the essence of a religious life. An inner discipline that has the purpose of cultivating these positive mental states. Thus, whether one leads a spiritual life depends on whether one has been successful in bringing about that disciplined, tamed state of mind and translating that state of mind into one's daily actions. Investigators have found that even an artificially induced frown or smile tends to induce the corresponding emotions of anger or happiness. This suggests that just going through the motions and repeatedly engaging in a positive behavior can eventually bring about genuine internal change. Although one's experiences are a consequence of one's past deeds, that does not mean that the individual has no choice or that there is no room for initiative to change. One should not become passive and try to excuse oneself from having to take personal initiative on the grounds that everything is a result of karma, because if one understands the concept of karma properly, one will understand that karma means action. So what type of future will come about, to a large extent, lies within our own hands in the present. It will be determined by the kinds of initiatives that we take now. Now, the secret to your own happiness, your own good future, is within your own hands. You must not miss that opportunity. The End